Hi guys, and welcome to this uh, webinar where we will actually be talking about composable commerce in a Very webinar exciting. series uh, from Columbus. We call, instead of webinars, we call them Columbinars, but that's all good and well. Um, it's going to be a series consisting of four parts. This is part number one. Uh, and today's topic is about talking how to compose so commerce yeah. solutions for customer action. Absolutely. Um, and regarding today's uh, topic, we uh, our presenters uh, today, we have invited um, our fine guests from Commerce Tools. So my name is Robin and I'm working as a, a strategic advisor and partner manager here at Columbus. And beside me in this room, we have Chelsea Warrington taking a sip of water because that's what you do in the morning. Um, but yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining. My name is Chelsea. I'm the partner lead for the Nordics for our partnerships um, at Commerce Tools. And of course, we also have the wonderful Margot, who is not in the room, but Margot. Hi, I'm, I'm Dal and in remotely. Thanks, Chelsea. And hi, everyone. My name is Margarita and I'm a senior customer success manager at Commerce Tools covering uh, Nordic region, Nordics region. Great. And today, uh, before we leave the word to uh, Commerce Tools, um, we wanted to take the opportunity to introduce our uh, Commerce Next Accelerator, which is a composable commerce um, packaging to help customers kickstart and launch their composable journey, actually. Mm -hmm. The thing uh, with this accelerator is that we uh, have compiled all our past knowledge from our 10 plus years in business, uh, building really complex solutions for our customers, where we now have uh, picked the best platforms we believe in the uh, commerce space. And um, so this accelerator consists of uh, commerce tools as the commerce engine. Uh, we have view storefront as the front end enabling piece. We have uh, Contentful to uh, deliver the headless content experience and content hub and Clevo driving the product discovery uh, piece. And for this next accelerator, what we have uh, packaged in there is a set of uh, connectors and accelerators from uh, UX practice standpoint, as well as full connectivity to help and orchestrate a customer journey from start to finish. Basically. And it uh, helps you to accelerate a starting point to kick off your composable journey, but it's also fully open and flexible. Mm -hmm. So it actually allows for that composableness to actually be true cool. in real life. So we have tons of add-ons um, uh, to to enhance and extend the solution. We will uh, kick in on that topic a little later. But uh, all in all, it actually uh, makes sure to um, ensure your solution to be stable, uh, scalable, uh, and high performance. So uh, really cool. And we call it Commerce Next uh, from Columbus. And uh, the X actually, the three X actually stands for uh, experience, which is the experience piece of enabling this full end-to-end uh, -end customer journey, personalized and uh, hyper personalized in real time for your benefit. And explore means that we can actually allow this connectivity and extend it to um, uh, allow for further innovation. And uh, it is then this open and modular experience. So mm -hmm. you have a starting point to get your life quick, but then uh, can actually use the uh, solution over time, switch out components as you grow, mm -hmm. uh, means that the total TCO for the product is actually gonna be uh, way, way less than uh, comparable solutions. So everyone wants, is not really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think um, we touched upon some of the benefits, but really what, what we mean with this accelerator is that instead of having these big design projects, big blueprint projects, we rather uh, rely on our own best practices to enable a fast time to market with this pre-built architecture components from these uh, four players. Uh, we will allay, enable then um, out of the box use cases standardized that can actually then be custom made for the customer uh, customer's needs instead of 
composing a solution from scratch and mm -hmm. building out the use cases. So all in all, um, it's going to uh, lower the project risk and, uh, as I mentioned before, lower the cost over time for, um, uh, for maintaining the solution. I think that is good enough for an intro. Uh, wouldn't you say so, Chelsea? I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, this, this is all over to you, Margot, if you would like to do the introduction, just so that everyone knows what we're going to go through today. Um, so yeah, Margot, over to you for now. Yep, yeah, sorry, wasn't your uh, classic. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's just uh, Chelsea Manson. So, a um, bit of an overview for today. We're going to start, uh, Chelsea is going to start with talking a little bit more about who we are, what we do, how we help customers. Then we're going to move over to yeah, why exactly we're talking about B2B uh, today, and then the benefits of composable commerce for you. Awesome. So yeah, I think mainly, thanks for that Margot as well, but I think mainly just for everyone's benefit today, this is just a slide that helps you understand exactly who we are at a glance. You can take little screenshots of this if you want, you can take this away, it's all public knowledge so it's all really interesting. Um, however, to boil all this down for you just so that you, um, you can have some nice takeaways, Commerce Tools, essentially, we are the inventor of composable commerce. We are also the coiners of the term headless, which essentially means you can decouple the front end from the back end and not compromise on your customer experiences or even buyer experiences if we're focusing on B2B. Um, and finally, we're also the co-founders of the Mac Alliance. Now, you can see the Mac Alliance there in a little orange square on the screen. Um, but really, the Mac Alliance is a fantastic community where agencies, technologies alike come together who can actually work under those four key principles of Mac, which are microservices, API first, cloud native and headless. And everything we do as a community, we work in cooperation, which is essentially cooperation with competitors and also just find new ways of expanding people's horizons, whether that be for, you know, uh, companies, B2B brands, B2C brands, wherever you are, everyone comes together to share in the same Mac principles. That's really cool, actually. I, I think it's quite nice, isn't it? Um, it's, it's a lovely community. And also, if you are, as, as Robin said, you know, coming, uh, embarking on your composable journey, it's a fantastic place to go on the website, understand who is actually there, who exists in that space. Um, because really, for you, the four, the four key areas, the, the principles themselves are the how to your composable vision at the end of the day. So yeah. everyone kind of build up and work out how best different pieces of technology can come together to have a build and buy effect and it's a wonderful place just to go and explore there are lots and lots of events that come up and you know you can always partake in them no matter where the region is uh, it's a global it's a global um, community so you might as well get involved wherever you are um, for me really the one key thing on this slide is we have a huge number of enterprise customers now for commerce tools really we are essentially the way I like to look at it is we're a toolkit of APIs. All of these APIs can connect you from one endpoint to another and utilize data in a way in which people can actually enhance those customer experiences, also enhance the way in which teams collaborate with one another, and also go ahead and deliver something that we like to call exceptional customer experiences. Um, and many of the brands you can see on the slide as well. Um, yeah, this is a really wonderful place to start if you've got a lot of complex solutions or you're, you're a complex business and you want to really focus in on those APIs that do such a fantastic job mm. across the board and actually just open up mm. those conversations with your customers in different ways. Yeah. And Margot, we have some brands that are uh, partly Columbus uh, Commerce Tools related, right? Besides these lovely brands here. Oh yes, there are there are a few examples. My favorite is Normit. It's a B2B mm. buying company based in Finland and opted in to, to work with Columbus and Commerce Tools. Um, mm. There are a few more details I would like to share about them later, if you don't mind. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. I love it. Um, next slide, I think. Yes. So yeah, you've sort of understood who we are, um, a little bit, nice little snapshot, but now what the, the comments I wanna go through, or the, the slides we wanna take you through today are literally why is B2B primed for change? It's a really important topic, and I think it's something that you can all take away and learn from and just sort of help to um, position yourselves in a way in which your vision is moving, where your business wants to go. Um, yeah, so why are we primed for change across B2B? Oh, this is swish. So, sorry, the um, the slide has changed color. It was originally orange, but I like this one. It's very nice. Um, so really for me, this is all about understanding that today in our society, change is the new norm. We've gone through COVID. We've got a whole load of different global uh, economic and also uh, let's say, um, relationship-based scenarios that are happening across the globe. 
change is the new normal and businesses have to be um, ready for that and be prepared in the best way to adapt to whatever is going on and also learn to thrive in times of uncertainty. So for B2B companies, the most important thing is if you think about change uh, being a constant now, um, B2B companies are bringing in a new influx of uh, colleagues, team members, and they're all Gen Z, digital natives, millennials. They're all used to having B2C-like experiences on a day-to-day, -day, you know, minute-by-minute -minute interaction. You can buy whichever pair of shoes you like at the end of your phone. You can even do reselling opportunities now. You can get personalized product recommendations, whatever you like. Mm -hmm. B2C experiences are really leading the way and omnichannel has become a topic of necessity versus just something of, you know, a want to have or would like to have. Um, so Actually, really, these... oh, so go for it. Okay, yeah. so There's one example that, that came to my mind just now, uh, uh, talking about Norma, our common customer. This is exactly this is exactly the example where with the B2B buyers change over time. For example, Normad had had relationships with customers that went that back decades, and as far as I know, many of them were quite happy to place orders, you know, that uh, over over phones or emails to sales reps. But the younger, the, the more you know, digital savvy, the Gen Z, they um, they found these interactions quite time consuming and inefficient, and that's why, uh, rephrasing you know a quote from the director of digital services at Normad. People in the mining industry, you know, where Normad is operating, is just people. They they use e-commerce. They want modern and simple purchase flows, not only in their personal lives, but for their work as well. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, I think that's a really, really good point. So these B2B companies are now embracing the idea of change and they're having to change because they're almost being forced to do so from mm. inside out, yeah. which is a really interesting way of evolving the way in which businesses now think and actually go to market mm. with with one another and more gen c's are also becoming decision makers absolutely yeah buying these services and are actually in control of the customer experience in yes that sense. yes so it's not just the end user b2b buyer but it's also the decision makers of yes. acquiring these kind of services and yeah. taking ownership of the customer experience absolutely. they are also uh, becoming more uh, gen z's yes as we see it. yes totally next slide very exciting yeah, this was for your quote, Margo, but uh, I think already was, covered it. You already covered it, <laughs> and this is this is exactly what we are uh, what, exactly, what, what yeah. we have in in this mutual client Normat. You will you will uh, speak about it again soon. I I, I know. Um, um, so this this guy for me, I feel really sorry for him to be honest, because he looks seriously frustrated a lot of the time. But I suppose it's actually why we are here. We're talking about the idea that many moons ago, or I say many moons ago, maybe twenty years ago or so. The B2B industry had hardly any choice when it came to selecting your tech stack. It was very much based around potentially a black box that you were given that was actually performing very well for B2C. But really, you were still maintaining paying for the whole use of that platform, even though you could only use, let's say, two or three parts maximum. Mm without the opportunity to be creative, to innovate, to actually find and build on this feeling of longevity and making sure that your businesses, which are actually founded on tradition, mm. are going to live on longer for the next few, let's say, 100, 200 years. Yep. Um, so really, this is all about understanding what kind of legacy you yourselves want to leave behind. Is mm. this the legacy where you're feeling stifled and stuck in a piece of technology that's not allowing you to innovate and weave your way through the market? Or is this about the legacy that means you want to have a feeling of longevity, you want to be able to give back to your teams, mm. the new people who are coming on board, the decision makers, how open minded would you like to be? Um, and for me, there's there's a fantastic, uh, fantastic leader across the MarTech space um, called Simon Sinek. Um, there are a lot of quotes by him and it's mm -hmm. all about leadership. Yes. And one of his best books for me is um, the idea of being, uh, or one of his best books is uh, the infinite minded mm -hmm. leader or mm -hmm. the infinite game. And in there, he talks about the progression and the involvement that you want to, you want to leave a legacy of feeling like you've contributed. Everybody wants to feel like they've contributed. So how are you yourself going to contribute to the businesses coming mm -hmm. up and progressing and leaving a good feeling for everyone else yeah, yeah. coming on board. And, and, and tracing back to what you said earlier, these classical legacy solutions, monolithic solutions, we can call yes. them, that are typically uh, crafted for retail, 
being in the industry for 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 a long time that's usually what we do so for b2b yeah. companies we plug in a, a, a retail like solution we customize for the uniqueness of the b2b complex really complex use cases and and buying journeys but you actually bring as you said on board a lot of legacy code that you have to maintain over mm -hmm. time it really gets you stuck yes you, you take it it's cumbersome big projects to actually take this piece of technology customize it to fit b2b mm -hmm. and then you need to maintain it over time and then now with all the change going on yeah. typically companies get stuck absolutely absolutely and i think the idea behind that is also talking about customization, you want to be able to customize, mm. but customize in the right way. So you are able to be innovative yes. and creative, not customizing to maintain and just keep the lights on. It's, it's mm. a very different kind of scenario yep. really yep. there. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah. Oh, this guy, I really like him. I feel like that should be me every morning after coffee. But um, this, this for me is a nice kind of thought process that a lot of the B2B um, space and also verticals, I think need to start thinking about, we've already mentioned about the millennials coming in, becoming decision makers, changing the way in which we want to go to market. Um, but loyalty for me, this isn't talking about B2C, as in we're going to give you discounts every time you come mm. back, or we're going to give you loyalty points, so you get your 10th coffee free, or whatever it might be. This is more about going, okay, how are you going to stand out from competition and make sure that your customer base is going to want to come back because of these frictionless, mm. seamless, lovely interconnected journeys that you are then able to offer. You can give them personalized recommendations, you can provide them with something that actually makes them only want to come back to you. Mm. Um, so the little play on words, I suppose, loyalty, not loyalty, it's loyalty as in you feel something, you feel connected with the brand that you so want to go back. And let's say with Norman, right, you want to go back and you want to get the specific drill type or you want to get the specific piece of machinery. Mm. Um, you want to be able to go back and know that you've got Scott on the end of the phone who's mm. having a good time, but also you can connect with him through different FaceTime channels, maybe, yes. Yes. or whichever, whichever way you want to engage, mm. that should make you feel more loyal. And it also allows you to have that interpersonal skill, which actually B2B is so, so well known for. Mm. Really. So actually in B2B, you, you start to talking about this, this omnichannel experience happening even yes. here. So you have the field sales reps, the, the, the people on the, uh, on the um, service desk taking taking incoming calls for, for spare parts or, or new sales opportunities. But then you have the e-com channel. Uh, you start adding then uh, all the kind of marketplaces that's going on. But now you're actually coming to the point of these new experiences actually demand Customers today actually demand within the B2B space to have this full sales service capabilities. Yes. So they want to have full transparency in product information, in pricing, in quoting. So it's not just taken away hidden somewhere in an email you sent off and then, you know, things come back yeah. in, an e in an email a few days later. This, this, is a, this is a process that should be open, that should be transparent. That's what your customers is, is looking for within this, uh, within this space. So allowing for that to happen, that for me, I believe, will, will also uh, increase loyalty. Yes, I agree. I completely agree. Um, so the next step, the next one is really understanding all of that. B2B needs to be more B2C-like mm. in the way in which you engage and the way in which you embrace omnichannel. Now, this is, this is kind of a, a nice slide, but I suppose really what we're looking at here, omnichannel is no longer an option. This should be something that you are embodying across your business internally and externally. Um, to ensure that those customer experiences and also team satisfaction are at an all-time high. Um, on the next slide as well, we've got just a sort of a breakdown about what we really mean when it comes to an omnichannel experience. So um, in, in, I suppose, the, uh, the arena of MarTech, uh, you've always got the conversation of right message, right time, right person. Mm. But that was kind of, well, let's say like 10, 10 years ago, that was the big thing. Now, this is what we're expecting. Mm. We're expecting the right content to match with the right channel at the right time, in the right location, understand the geography. Is the currency correct? Are you looking to go international? How are you breaking down those borders and how best can you do that and harness data mm. to ensure you're going to get there at the right time? Yeah. Um, and this is something that I feel that B2B have, uh, sorry, B2C have really rehearsed and executed and with the let's call it the flare up of COVID and a mm. global pandemic, mm. they were forced to extend their channels, extend the way they go to market and extend the way they talk to people. 
Um, and I think there comes a, a point where I foresee that B2B is actually going to overtake and expand their ways in which they can do business yeah. because they are so much more complex than B2C. Mm. There's this element of B2B, um, you know, you've got your internal customers, you've got your internal teams, you've got the way in which your buyers want to go through self-service, but equally at the same time, how all this complexity can be opened up into so many more different, wonderful ways of innovating, creating. I, I personally think that B2B has the biggest opportunity here to do something really great with, yeah. with all of this. As, as do we. I mean, all, the, the <laughs> customers, the, the customers that are in the forefront that we that we help and serve in this manner, it, it's exactly this to the point that saying how to can we connect channels. So from mm -hmm. so from the corporate website to the e-commerce solution to a product configurator, um, uh, email services, all of that uh, at once. So I think this slide really resonates with me because it's that kind of level of complexity and then and then adding the, the kind of purchase flows uh, that goes on in the background and then yeah. the new channels on top of that, the hybrid selling model, all of that new buzzwords that's coming along yeah. uh, affecting B2B. I think, you know, this is key to to solve, uh, you know, the, the constant message across uh, all of these complex channels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so really, uh, a really good point. So this is, for me, the exciting bit, right? How does composable commerce actually benefit you as a company, as an audience? So this is going to be an interesting sort of uh, flip-flop between myself and Margot, and obviously Robin's going to help us out where but we it. need it. Um, but I do think that this is going to be um, areas in which you can take away some ideas, take screenshots, look at some stats, make sure you go back and share it with your teams. Um, but for me, there are four key benefits, right? And this is where we sort of like to start. When it comes to composable commerce, um, for me, you're going to hear a few things throughout these examples about flexibility and agility. We've already spoken that we are the coiners of the term headless, meaning you can decouple front end and the back end. For me, I like to look at that as being almost, you know, you've got your plumbing in the background for, let's say, a really good washing machine, but you know for a fact if the plumbing is good, your end result of really good washing is going to be absolutely stunning. You're going to have beautiful whites and everything for <laughs> however long. Um, but if the plumbing in the background isn't so good, it's mm. going to cause a couple of issues. You might get a pink sock in there and then it's at the wrong temperature and then everything else sort of Ouch. happens. And <laughs> yeah, the nightmare. Um, but I think for me, this is understanding that that separation piece and knowing how you can actually start to create and be as flexible as you like mm. when it comes to selecting what you want to see on the front end and what's happening in the back end. Mm. Um, Understanding for a company which is as complex as, let's say, a B2B company, a B2B enterprise, you've, you're going to have tons of pockets of data surrounding you wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And it's about accessing that data at the right time mm -hmm. to make sure you can deliver something exciting, which takes you to the third point, which is all about connecting you from one endpoint via APIs that do their jobs exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. And then opening, expanding, and being as seamless as possible yeah. across whichever touch point, channel, new operation you want to go down. Um, and then finally, understanding that you have harnessed all that data. It's about being true to your tradition as a company, but telling your unique story across each and every single channel and no knowing that you are connecting with your customers or your buyers at the end of the day in a way that is true to you and your brand. Mm. Um, so these are four kind of elements you're probably going to hear uh, throughout these customer stories and the different topics. Mm. Um, so it's just worth keeping in mind. I think I think the, the uh, tons of favorites on this one. I think the API first mindset, that that to me is, is just a game changer within this whole tech stack. Yes. So instead of just saying, hey, this is the feature we want to build from the, from the kind of uh, traditional uh, monolithic solutions, you kind of have these use cases uh, and, and you want to then expose it into an API and then you communicate to, to build an innovative uh, thing in the front end. That's really cumbersome and that takes a lot of time. Instead of saying, this is the kind of the capability that we're after, start from the set of APIs. You have mm -hmm. more than 300 APIs in, in your toolbox and, 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 and more so. To, to start crafting uh, an experience with an API first mindset, meaning that you actually utilize the capabilities of that API, extend it rather than having this 
I come back to that again, bulk of code that you need to maintain and then iterate it yeah. and then expose the API. That's just a game changer in how, you, how fast you can innovate. So. Yeah, and I mean, Margot, I think you've got a perfect example later on that we're going to go through anyway to mm. explain that. So I'm looking forward to that example because cool. it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, so really, I mean, for me, I'm all about butterflies. I love butterflies anyway. So this is a perfect slide to actually express that exceptional is really the only way forward now. There isn't the choice anymore of being, oh, that'll do. There isn't that option anymore of, oh, that's good enough. And we can just sort of apologize later, mm. you know, that, that kind of thing. It has to be exceptional. Um, the idea for me really that exceptional is the only thing that counts, the only thing that matters. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think we're so used to that now. Consumer mm. demands are at all time high. Um, everybody who wants to be looking at something that they have in a day to day experience, then experiencing that in their job. Mm. I think that's only fair, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next, next little slide. So here we go. Delivering excellence. These are just some ideas that you can take away and utilize. But for me, this is all about harnessing the idea that knowing that APIs can connect you to whichever endpoint at any time. As you said, this is about iterating and building off the back of something that you go, no, actually, we like this element, mm. but we need to change and focus on the incremental wins. So mm. how are we going to do that? Mm. Where are the areas that are getting us money? And how can we also focus on increasing the revenue that's going to come mm. through that channel? Um, and really, at the end of the day, delivering ex excellence for me comes down to providing your customers, your buyers with the um, the required information they need at any one time, wherever they are, which therefore, at the end of the day, drives loyalty. And mm. they want to come back to you over any of your competition. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, true. I think I said my point on the previous one. The transparency. I, I think that's, <laughs> that to me sells it, yeah. sells it up. Well, Margaret, you... this one's over to you. Yeah, true. Thanks, Chelsea. Uh, and, and talking about, you know, delivering excellence, there is uh, no way I cannot mention our customer, Dawn Foods. It's a B2B manufacturer and distribu uh, distributor of bakery ingredients and goods to over 22,000 bakeries globally. And they found themselves in a bit of a similar boat as Norman, where um, a new customer base of younger clients, they, they weren't too keen on having their you know, orders taken on a piece of paper. And they began requesting a new digital ordering process and a catalog that was easier to use. And to meet those, those demands and those requirements of an evolving customer base and as, uh, as well to, to expand, Downfood sought to add a self-service capabilities leveraging e-commerce so that um, their customers could quickly and efficiently manage their accounts, browse part of catalog and, and place orders. And with, with Donfo's card and checkout processes, all Bell and Commerce tools, customers can now see their order history. They can pick the order and then reorder and all in three clicks. Talk about being easy. They're done. Uh, plus, with the new e-commerce functionality, the, the customers can now view the entire product catalog online for the very first time, which uh, makes it easier for customers to search, find, and buy um, yeah, and at the click at the bottom of the button. And as a result, the, the exposure of uh, more products to the customers that you know, many bakers were not aware even that Don Foods provides, the basket size, uh, the basket size uh, increased by up to 10% for Don Foods. Mm -hmm. But what, what amazes me personally in this case is how with the help of composable approach, uh, it's a you know, essentially all traditional B2B company that up to a few years ago didn't have any e-commerce touch point uh, managed to, to make online orders account for over 25% of all orders uh, with an average of two extra, uh, up to never before bought products per cart. Mm. That's really I love that. Honestly, yeah. I think it's what, it's almost one of my favorite examples, <laughs> almost, because I'm teeing up yes. the next ones. Um, <laughs> but no, honestly, yeah, I think it's really cool. I think the way in which they have been able to adapt is one of those really uh it's one of the takeaway points for me it's mm. about going okay as margot as you say this is this is a traditional company it's very much b2b focused but they've been able to adapt this to have a b2b to c type experience mm. and i mean 
for me to have a one click purchase. I mean, I don't think I'd ever need to go on and buy, for example, the whole red velvet mix for a bakery. But at the same time, it makes me more inclined to want to go and do that because it's just so simple. And I think the element of having simplicity added into that we're all busy people. Um, we want to be able to have the most simple frictionless journey to get to that, that yeah. purchase point. And I think yeah. they've they've highlighted that really well. Definitely, definitely. Cool. So uh, you might be thinking, okay, this sounds great, uh, but it also sounds as though there can be, you know, a lot of components and a lot of areas. But now this is something that I'd like everyone to just hone in on, I suppose. This is about reducing your costs, but not having to uh, forego any of the desire and the dreams and the vision of where you want to get to. Mm. So reducing the costs without the compromises. Mm. Um, everything that is on here for me is about understanding and harnessing how your business can be faster, more agile, automate various laborious, uh, let's say, workflows, understanding how your teams can actually collaborate together in a more effective way. So when it comes to thinking about Composable and Mac, the, the four elements we mentioned before, um, for me, I look at it as sort of being two sides of a brain, one side being your creative vision, where you want to get to. Mm. So let's say your marketing teams yep. and your campaign teams are all on here, creative teams. And usually nine times out of 10, you log a ticket for IT and they go away and they come back in about a week, two weeks, depending on what they feel like. Yeah, um, that's not pretty even quick. longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm being optimistic. Um, and then um, on the other side of the brain, you have your IT teams, but you have essentially your Mac principles. This is all about how to your vision of your what, which is the composable. And for me to combine the two sides of that brain, allow you to engineer those efficiencies across mm. the board. Mm. You've also touched on upon it before, which is reducing the TCO. Mm -hmm. So total cost of ownership. Why is that? And how do we get around doing that? We've got two, no, we've got one example, I think after this one, which actually take you through it. Um, but understanding really the, how your business itself actually reduces the um, maintenance costs, understanding that you yourselves can select the technology that match your company, mm. you can actually flip various components in and out to suit the way in which you want to do your business. Exactly. I think that's that just tells it all. Instead of having one solution um, that sits in the middle, everyone has to adapt their work processes yes. to fit that piece of technology. Yes. This is the complete opposite. You can actually pick the components that best fit your needs and your different teams because Absolutely. you want the teams to come together to actually share their experiences, marketing teams, IT teams, and creative teams, uh, and business teams. Yeah. <laughs> um, so throughout the, the full journey, how to orchestrate from, from master data management to campaign orchestration to, to full front end experience, require different components. So instead of having one piece of technology that forces companies to one work stream, yep. Yep. you can then pick the, the, the tools that fit your uh, needs best. Absolutely. And, and you can actually tailor that over time. So I think that kind of is, is what brings back uh, the total cost of the ship is actually going down over time as, yep. as teams and needs uh, evolve. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Margot, you ready for the, uh, the wonderful customer example now? Absolutely. Yes. There's, actually one more, there's one more addition I would like to make on this one. Uh, so talking about operational costs, for example, we have another customer, Salin Group, who, who managed, uh, who saw a 75% reduction in operation costs after they mm -hmm. migrated to commerce stores. But talking about uh, being more digital, being more uh, agile and delivering better, this is uh, Chelsea's favorite example, and like, I could not, not mention it, right? Um, so I would like to yeah, talk about breathing fresh air into, into your e-commerce or into your commerce, uh, as the slide says. So Trox is, uh, is a global leader in design, manufacture, and distribution of components, devices, and systems for room ventilation and air conditioning with um, 27 subsidiaries um, uh, uh, global, globally, sorry, worldwide. And so the, the, the challenge with this company already started from the point that the software for product configuration in the air electronics is extremely sophisticated as both purchase and sales of ventilation systems require a really high level of technical know-how. And to further complicate Trux's case, they, they have over 30 million possible product configurations without having this standardized uh, master product. And in addition to that, a 40-year-old ERP system that, that was really slow. 
So what they what they what they did, what they had to do, uh, Chalks decided they needed to replace their uh, their how they call it easy product finder solution. It's basically um, a complex software that was responsible for assembling and pricing highly individualized uh, products. So by choosing commerce tools, uh, Chalks was able to to build a new um, product finder solution, basically an algorithm that was permanently running in the background and it was determining if the customers desired component components suit one another and if this combination is uh, even possible to be produced at all. And mm-hmm. after being validated, this final product will be added to, to the shopping cart and ready to be ordered. So both these processes, adding to the cart and, and ordering, they made possible thanks to the Commerce Source Flexible API. And because of our API-first approach and fle- flexible microservices, the implementation of the product configuration in the existing ERP was easy and seamless. And um, in addition to that, not only the solution requires the existing uh, requirements, it also opens the door. It opens the door for future possibilities like um, using you know next gen technology, next gen technologies, and concentrating on revenue generation opportunities like you guys previously talked about, you know, being able to choose uh, what to do and what vendors to work with. But my favorite result here, however, is not this. It's um, the Trox was uh, was able to um, create to enable a uh, highly personalized self-service B2B commerce process for the business customers. And they are always prepared to quickly react to, to all the new challenges coming their way because of this um, flexible microservices architecture and, and following the API first approach. Yeah. So I, I think this I is great. I'm yeah. so excited about this example. Because it's, 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 well, I see all it's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's so great for the fact also that this this kind of configurator story that that you just said. I mean, you you can look at it both ways. You can look at it as a potential sales configurator um, for for sales rep to actually know how to quote a product because yeah. typically these assembled parts doesn't come with a price tag unless you assemble it or configure it, yeah. and and to to have that kind of logic sitting in an ERP that that typically is what holds you back in innovation. That it's hard to be transparent on pricing, so extend that logic, building it in a composable way, allows you to build sales configurators as well as customer facing configurators. Yeah. So customers can actually go online and make a quote uh, and demand uh, and that kind of shortened sales cycle. So great example, great I think story. It's, I think it's brilliant. Yeah. I just get very excited by the whole, I suppose, innovation side of it. Yeah. But hey, that's another chapter for a bit, <laughs> so that's all right. So um, this, is, this is gonna be quite a simple slide. I mean, it's not really a simple topic. I think we could have a whole separate webinar or columbinar on this anyway, at a later date. But really this is about understanding the C part of Mac. So oh. this is the cloud native or nativity of that, mm-hmm. the idea, is that the right word? Mm-hmm. I just made that yeah. up, I'm not really mm-hmm. sure. I feel like that's Christmas late, isn't it? So, <laughs> um anyway so this this for me is really about harnessing and understanding that with cloud native structure truly being a cloud native solution you actually have security in the knowledge that no matter what time of year you're going to be doing let's say a new product launch or you are changing uh depending on for for b2c as an example black friday Mm. um you know that uh during sale periods you are going to be able to have as many uh, visitors to the website and actually the cloud almost reacts. I like to think of it almost as a sponge. Mm. When you put it into water, you can put a little bit in and it absorbs the water. You put a little bit more in, you fully submerge it and it's taking in all that water. But then when you don't need that water, you can squeeze it out yeah. and it can contract back down mm. to the normal way of running. Yeah. So if you've ever been been under pressure or you've um, noticed that during sales seasons or peak seasons, you have issues with a slowing down website or the running is just not quite as up to speed as you want, the experiences are a little bit clunky or even you have a complete outage, mm. this is going to be one of the biggest benefits mm. of moving into a cloud native solution. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, just, just before we move into that, I think that's exactly the piece that, that holds some companies back. So for instance, instead of instead of just ramping up 
uh, extra CPU power to to allow that existing solution to scale. Mm -hmm. um, it can actually be the individual, but it can actually be the request around pricing, for instance. Yes. That's really complex yes. in B two B. It can actually be one call to the front end, but it actually consists of several aggregated calls to multiple ERPs mm -hmm. and PLM solutions and whatnot to actually be able to serve that uh, unique price for that customer uh, in checkout, for instance. Absolutely. That could be a really cumbersome process and. To, to be able to scale out that on a uh, classical monolithic solution is really hard because you scale out everything, yes. even though you just need to scale that individual bit. So for composable, it's exactly your sponge example. I think that's <laughs> that's it. If you need to scale that uh, piece of logic around pricing, for instance, that is uh, more easy to do. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, I, really I would have like used that. a sponge as a cake as well, but obviously that doesn't <laughs> quite work. You just eat the whole thing. I mean, sorry, Margot, over to you. Take it. I mean, take your time. I like listening to you guys as well. Now, okay. Another example, you know, talking about about scaling. Uh, what comes to mind is our customers. Uh, our customer Nuku is a leading international company in interior and landscaping and the related supply chain market. They're based in the Netherlands and they provide an extensive range of plants, planters, and value-added services to the. Landscapers, exporters, florists, web shops, green, green retailers, you name it. And their first kind of inroads into e-commerce was aiming at increasing revenue beyond this just direct sales department. However, the, the web shop worked, worked only well, um, well they, it worked only for customers that knew exactly what they wanted. They had a, a quite an extensive offering on display uh, and, and the web shop requires crawling page by page and lacks intuitive uh, product discovery capabilities to capture new clients. Another pain point for, for Newcup was that um, the, the homegrown uh, platform was uh, only incurring costs and, and, and reaching the end of its life cycle. So that's why Newcup had to and decided to kind of future-proof their, their e-commerce uh, with Mac-based architecture. And um, by choosing commerce source composable commerce, they were able to, to revamp their uh, B2B e-commerce shop and make it available in in four languages in over uh, in all, over 40 countries, which led to almost a hundred percent increase in sales. And uh, this new approach, right, the API and cloud native approach, they it enabled Newcop to automate its current e-commerce functions, such as advanced search, order history, delivery information, which in turn as well reduced calls to the their internal sales team. Uh, meaning that the actual salespeople were had more free time now to to focus on their actual roles of being trusted advisors instead of being you know support people. Um, but my favorite point in, in this story is that uh, beyond just placing orders, the new web shop inspires clients with with uh, you know interior and landscaping ideas to increase cross selling opportunities. So, for example, a um, customer who would buy a particular plant may be interested in matching parts or even, I don't know, a complete plant display that can be assembled for them. And in addition to that, Newcoop can adapt the, the product catalogs um, to, to segmented target audiences such as florists, project designers, garden centers, uh, you name it, and, and differentiate those by country. And capturing this data um, as well enables the, the, for example, the wholesalers to feature products that match specific customer needs per customer, per group, per country, um, and so on. Do you want to buy, buy a plant yet? <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, I definitely do. I yeah. Buy it for yourself. And I mean, that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty impressive personalization as well. Yeah. Know, right. Yeah. No, that, that's great. And I think I, I think you touched upon something really cool there, Margot. I think I think the whole idea around really exposing your digital channels in the B two B space. Typically, you fall into those kind of management discussions. How will how will exploring uh, online sales actually potentially cannibalize on yes. traditional sales? Yes. I, I really like that story around how they actually manage to combine the strength of both channels. And as you pointed out so clearly, free up time for their field sales reps, not to de-size the team, but mm -hmm. rather for them to focus on other things, new value added things that actually bring in new business. Yes. Innovative ideas and, and ways to actually free up time from those simple uh, orders that, that, that you just have to place in a system. Absolutely. You free up time to actually bring in those complex 
big new businesses. So yeah. uh, really great case. I mean, my only sad point is in my new house that I've recently bought, um, the, the plant that's on, on show at the moment, <laughs> it died in my house. So I don't uh, think I should be buying any more plants anytime soon. I can't oh, help you with anyway. that. I'm, I'm <laughs> terrible too, but I can't, I, I can't help you. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so this is the final chapter now for everybody. So thank you so much for just joining with us all the way through. But really, this is just something that I think is at the heart of everything that Commerce Tools does and actually allows you to do. Um, we've spoken about ways in which, you know, innovation can kind of come to the fore, different channels and things. But really, this, this for me is about understanding how innovative your teams can be. This is what this chapter means. Um, it's about knowing that you have a company vision, you have a drive to get to a certain point, and actually your teams can be part of that whole movement. They can be part of that legacy that you want to leave behind, that longevity. They feel like they're being, um, you know, uh, part of this bigger movement that you want to be you want to be driving and leaving as a legacy mm. um yeah the next next slide is obviously good but i really think that for me the the fourth point on this slide is kind of characteristic of everything you need to do the, the wonderful thing about having a composable solution that is based on microservices and apis your teams can actually experiment. Mm. They can have fun with what they're doing. They can enjoy the idea of creating something and then knowing if it doesn't work out, you can just undo one step. It's mm. as simple as just pressing the undo button on you know, like a Word document or yep. something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, because really you're not having to pause, break, uh, wait for these massive upgrades before mm. you can start innovating. Mm. This is about taking and harnessing those points that you are looking to make incremental wins, mm. slight tweaks, customize it in a way that your teams really want to see this kind of opening up of this vision of um, understanding where your, your consumers and customers and whoever it might be users are, are going through that journey with you. Yeah. Um, your teams can actually be instrumental around yeah. that and yeah. never never fear about breaking anything exactly. because that is you know one of the worst things to happen and i think this is this is we didn't talk about too much about the headless yet but this is exactly yeah. where where headless comes into play so experimenting is, is actually what the headless piece allows you to do so coming back to that piece where you had the creative teams and the tech <laughs> yeah, teams. The brain. <laughs> the, the brain. <laughs> yeah. So so having the, the the experimental team actually allowing you guys to feedback from customers or checking your data where the drops off or pain points are in your customer journey today with this kind of composable architecture, you can actually then do incremental changes to yes. product pages, to checkout pages, because the individual components, as we've been told before, it, it doesn't they are not built in one solid block. Yes. Um, it actually consists of these individual components. So if you want to move things around, if you want to add custom logic, if you want to enhance the UX, so in the mm -hmm. front end uh, layer, because it's, it's headless decoupled from, from the back end logic. So I think yeah. this is this is exactly where the creative uh, can happen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was lucky enough now that you sort of mentioned that I was lucky enough um, maybe a year ago to be at a Mac Alliance event. Uh, it was actually in Stockholm, mm -hmm. you know, funnily enough. Yeah. Um, hence, we're here again today. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the CMO at Nordic Nest was talking and he was saying how much it meant to his team moving away from a monolithic solution where everything had to be governed and dictated mm -hmm. and actually now he could increase not only the intake of new people into his team because mm -hmm. also it's multilingual right yep. we don't have to worry about having certain qualifications for various people you mm -hmm. can actually have all the developers across the languages yes. utilizing their own skills mm -hmm. um, so not only were they happy with the fact that they are comfortable in their knowledge and mm -hmm. they can actually execute they also had this almost break off team uh, groups teams group of teams i can't get the words out um otherwise known as pizza teams mm -hmm to help deliver and change and work on a specific area and as you say iterate yes. and then lead into something mm. that is going to you know be really instrumental mm. in what mm. the business is doing. No, I, I think so exactly and with these teams the business teams it's typically isolated around these yes. capabilities so it can come back to stock and cutoff times and avail product availability it's typically a pain point we've talked about 
complex B2B pricing, that's another one. Yeah. So you could actually isolate these microservices around pricing yes. and availability. That could actually be working as separate tech teams to allow uh, that piece of innovation to expose those kind of data points and, and, and uh, custom attributes that, that these customers are needing um, as an isolated piece. And then you experiment in the front end how that's going to be uh, presented to the client. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's brilliant. Anything else yeah. worth mentioning on here? Um, not on this one. I mean, we can we can go to the next yeah. slide and see what happens. Good. Um, so this is, Margaret, this is another opportunity for you to share. Actually, before before I jump deeper into this one, I um, just wanted to add, so uh, innovation and, and, and increased dev speed is really a hot topic for a lot of our customers. And there are quite a few examples, for example, having, you know, um, time to market uh, agility. There's, there's a customer of ours, Emma Sleep, who, it took them only four weeks to to launch their first site, first market. Um, we have, you know, we have um, John Lewis who who took fifteen minutes to ingest over three hundred thousand products uh, into commerce tools, whereas it took them days to to do that with ATG. And you know, there is there is another customer that was Chronix saying that they have seen an eighty percent increase in developers' productivity. Uh, when when switching mm. to commerce tools, so a lot of a lot of possibilities there. But we're talking about B two B example um, example specifically. Uh, you know, you can mach your catalog interactive with uh, that was that's what Gabarit um, our customer did. They are um, Gabarit is an international um, company that specializes in the manufacturing and supplying of uh, sanitary and technology products. Um, in order to, to simplify the process of, of finding and selecting the right products and systems and parts of, for their B2B buyers, Gebeta needed a new digital strategy. And at its core, it had to be flexible, multi-channel business solution, uh, multi-currency as well, that would provide uh, product data across various channels and enable create an interactive product catalog to provide easier more intuitive shopping experience for as well different audiences talk to I don't know, architects plumbers you name it and after a careful evaluation of various e-commerce systems they actually um, decided to, to adopt a commercial solution and the particular motivation for for that choice was the flexibility that we offered um, that you know that was offered by commerce tools api first approach and, and microservice architecture and the solution we, we provided was um, significantly accelerated the development of those individual user interfaces. So the entire catalog with many thousands of articles could be presented online and um, in interactive format. Today, um, yeah, like wholesalers, tradespeople, architects, and consumers are able to access the entire Gabarit product page, product range, sorry. Um, examine technical details, which are also quite quite complicated. Compile shopping lists and, and download data on individual products directly as you know PDFs or other files. And uh, by using commerce tools and a composable commerce approach, uh, Gabriel was able not only to create a flexible solution that provides you know data to to current channels, but also kind of future proof their commerce by by being able to offer data to any kind of, uh, of front-end touch point, be it a design portal, AI, uh, AR, VR, or whatever, you know, whenever comes next. <laughs> I love that. Do you know, actually, annoyingly, this might compete with Trox as my favorite mm. example. It yeah. might. I haven't decided yet, but it could. Um, I just like the idea of an interactive catalog. I think mm. that for me is, is a really, really clever way of utilizing APIs mm. and also accessing the right data. And then other sort of areas is really just about being as flexible as possible. Mm. Um, so I just think it's a, it's a brilliant example yeah. again. Because it, uh, coming back to what c c customers within the B2B space that we so typically do, they upload a PDF of, yes. of the, as part of their range. And if they're a multi-language, multi-site uh, or global company, it's a PDF of several hundred pages yes. uh, with different languages. But really, in essence, what you want to be doing is coming back to your slide with context and everything, so data mm -hmm. in real time in the right context. I think that's exactly it. We can actually call upon the API to render that unique experience for that specific uh, uh, product 
in context to uh, the brand and actually just serve that HTML yeah. of product information. So you don't need to click through hundreds and hundreds of, of pages in How PDF. Yeah. Because that kind of technology is, is, is kind of dead and obsolete once you publish it. So yes. this is a, a great way of actually serving through APIs that exec data, extract it and present it to customers at the right time. Absolutely. So yeah. that's, that's really, Love really it. great. Okay, cool. Um, so I suppose final point really, but from the VP of digital, I think this sort of sums up everything we are encompassing here and all the all the examples that Margot has walked us through today. So the VP of digital at Dawn Foods actually said, look, we've been doing the same thing for a hundred years. But what actually comes now is what do we need to do to stay relevant for the next 100 years? Mm. And I think this really is what embodies or personifies uh, composable as a whole. And actually for B2B in particular, um, we are we are companies founded on tradition. That is that is essentially who we are. That is what runs through you know your, your bloodstream, as it were. Um, what are you going to be able to do with the world that is coming up to be so digital so uh, adaptable you've got to be keeping up with the pace of change how are you going to remain with that tradition with that unique experience that you want to deliver how are you then going to put that into your strategy and actually start to be able to be multiple components who come together to realize your vision and your your message for the next 100 mm. years I, I think that's that sums it up perfectly i mean there are so many fortune 500 companies yes. that has been gone extinct for looking back just just 10 15 20 years yeah um so this is this is really in essence not a question i think you you put it forward very <laughs> nicely but if you turn a look at it from the other aspect if you don't innovate and yes. and and look at it from that point of view you could actually uh, be gone within, within a few years so so yeah. that's how quick uh, what's the price of can not being not able doing to it yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i think that's that's really um, that's really um, resonates with me as well yeah <laughs> all right so uh, that I'm was uh, the time as well yes. i mean Everyone, I was just going to say, everyone, thank you so much for staying on with us. I know that yeah. we've there was a little bit of a glitch uh, to start off with, so we do apologise for the late start of this. But thank you so much for being on. Yes. Um, we do have a slide and option for questions, but it really depends on how long everybody has, because I know we're slightly overrunning. Slightly overrunning, yeah. Um, we had yeah. we had one we had one uh, question coming in around how how you can actually go about starting, uh, you know, these this this kind of composable journey. Um, we talked a lot about headless being one enabler, innovation another enabler. Uh, how how could actually because you have you have this this kind of toolbox, but I'm uh, I know about the product also, but can we maybe elaborate a little bit where you could potentially start? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Margot, we can also sort of utilize you in this when you get new customers. But for me, where where we've kind of seen things and uh, customers come to us is really understanding what that headless piece actually looks like. Mm. So how do you go about decoupling the front end from the back end yeah. to know that the experiences you want to get to are mm. something that's going to be um, as adaptable, as innovative as possible from the back end. Mm -hmm. And then you can focus on the technology that surrounds you on the front. Mm -hmm. But that is sort of probably the first port of call when people come to us. Mm -hmm. Other times it can be as simple as we need to break down data silos and we don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's an idea of looking at the um, uh, the Trox example with the ERP system. Yep. You know, you can actually utilize the technology you have mm -hmm today in existence but you can slowly phase them out i think we call that something like a strangulation yeah. process right mm -hmm. so you can also take a look at that but also when it comes to commerce tools itself um we now have a portfolio of products right mm. we like to refer to ourselves as that sort of SaaS product solution for commerce mm. um we have the front end op um, I was going to say opportunity. That's the wrong word. We have yep. the front end product. Mm -hmm. um, we've obviously got commerce tools for back end. We've got checkout now. Um, we have a whole other multitude of different, essentially any API that you'd like mm. to connect and utilize. We mm. have 350 plus that yeah. do their job exceptionally well. Mm. Mm. Um, so really, we are a bunch of unopinionated APIs that you can connect wherever yeah. you like. Yeah. Um, and I think that's 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 really good because uh, going back to that that kind of headless piece enabling that. I mean. What we say from Columbus' perspective is that if, if you want to go about decoupling the front end, either you, you take on the heavy bit, which could be yes. the checkout, and, and you can you can try and, and isolate the logic and, and really build away from, from the checkout, uh, go headless. That's that that's 
will be the biggest project or mm -hmm. you, you turn to uh, look to what, what the, the commerce tools check out, which is a separate product, what mm -hmm. that looks like that can help you benefit. Or you take the headless approach, maybe uh, on the more static uh, pages. Yep, so without the, the heavy business logic, um, content pages and so on. So you try to gradually, that could be on the corporate website of things, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, gradually um, uh, move on to, to the headless experience. Yeah. So, so that's a that's a good way of, of, of doing that. Great. Um, just one more comment from my side here. I think what I've yeah. seen uh, uh, customers that succeeded the most is uh, take a starting small. Start with one market. Start with one brand. You don't have to to go bing bang and and, and you know replace your uh, the whole ecom landscape in in one go. Take small steps. Um, compose your journey and uh, and you'll succeed. I think that was great. That was a lovely note to end. On, I, think. <laughs> I think so too. <laughs> famous famous last words, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I know. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you guys so much for uh, being with us. Run out of time, I think we? we have. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you again and uh, be sure to uh, catch us next time. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for having us. All right. Thank you guys. Bye, <laughs> everybody. All right. Bye, Bye for now.